Affairs and Chief Diversity Officer, who's been working with many of us around campus to continue improving. Uh, so, Glenn. All right. Thanks, Apo and Arda. And just want to say on behalf of our president, Dr. Or Hurst Peskovich and our entire senior leadership team, I want to welcome you to Oakland University and to this event. You know, the Oakland University Diversity Pledge is recited as stand up, stand strong, stand together. And when we take that pledge, it means that we will work to ensure that everyone within our campus community has the right to live, the right to work, the right to study in the community where they feel welcome safe, included, valued, and accepted. Now, I grew up in Mexican Village in Detroit, Michigan. I attended Earhart Middle School, St. Hedwig High, and graduated from Western High School and worked at LaSalle back in the late 70s and early 80s. And so when I think about the kickoff of Hispanic Celebration Month here at Oakland University, I see it as an opportunity to create awareness and support for our Hispanic and Latinx community. In this year of the unexpected, the unseen, the undesired, the unplanned, Hispanic Celebration Month allows us time to reflect on the rich, I mean rich history of Hispanics in America. The vision, the struggle, the rise, and the continued elevation. So I wanna thank the planning committee for all the work that they've done to provide us a rich month of programs and activity that will educate us and make us more aware. Today's panel discussion on the intersectionality of experiences, issues, challenges, and opportunities is very timely. As we see a year, again, with the unexpected, the pandemic, the protests around social justice, equality, inclusion. All of these things are tied to the Hispanic community. And so when we began this discussion on various topics, all these things should be near and dear to each one of our hearts. When we talk about education and higher education, it means that we're willing to expand our boundaries, knowledge, and our experiences and become capable of becoming change agents. And that's what I think education is about at Oakland University and any institution. And so I thank our panelists for being here today, representing their excellent institution, Wayne State University, University of Michigan, University of Florida, and Quicken Loans. I thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you, we value you. And at the end of the month, my hope is that we all stand a little bit taller and become a little bit more committed, a little bit more courageous in going to those dark places that sometimes we know need a little bit more light shed on them. And when we do that, we change the world and we make it better for everyone. And so again, thanks for having me today. I'm looking forward to listening leaning in on the discussion and learning a lot. God bless everyone. Thank you, Glenn, for your words of support and for all that you do around campus. And I'll, I'll move on to introduce our first panelist for today, uh, Ethereum Cash Brammer. He's a Chicano writer and scholar uh, from El Centro, California. He currently serves as an assistant dean for the Rackham Graduate School at the University of Michigan, where he's also the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, and implementation lead. Dr. Brammer has translated a number of historically significant works from early U.S. Latino literature, and is uh, here with us today to begin this discussion. Muy buenas uh, tardes a todos. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all. Um, for you know, this beginning part of the panel, uh, one, I'd like to thank Oakland University and the Planning Committee for the invitation. Um, I was asked to talk about you know, just definitions of what does it mean to be Afro-Latinequis? How has that identity and cultural heritage come to exist historically? And so 
our story begins long before 1619 or uh, 1492. Um, for thousands of years before the arrival of European colonizers, indigenous people interacted, traded, intermarried, and lived in interconnected communities, large and small, throughout Turtle Island, or what is now known as Las Américas. Having said that, I think it's important to quickly acknowledge that our event uh, being hosted by Oakland University in the state of Michigan is on the territory of the Anishinaabe people, or the Three Fires Confederacy, which is comprised of the Ojibwa, Adawa, and Badawatomi nations. In addition, I'd also like to acknowledge that wherever you're joining uh, us from today, if you're located anywhere on Turtle Island, North or South America, you are on indigenous land. And as we celebrate Latinidad and Afro-Latinidad, it is also important to lift up our indigenous ancestors as well. So as the nursery rhyme goes, in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Too often, this is where our story begins, and it completely erases thousands of years of history, culture, language, and stewardship of this land by indigenous people. But it's undeniable that the world changed in 1492 in ways um, that we could never have predicted. In 1493, it's important to note that that's when we first had enslaved people in the Americas. The first enslaved people in the Americas were the Taino in uh, what was then you know, proclaimed to be Española and what is now an island divided between um, the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Um, in 1513, the first African person to arrive in what is now the United States was actually a free African person. His name was Juan Garrido, and he was part of the Ponce de Leon expedition in what is now Florida. And so I, I think it's powerful that our first African person, this is also a narrative that's not often shared, the first African person to come to the Americas was not an enslaved person. In 1517, the first enslaved African people uh, in what is now Haiti during colonial times were brought. And it's important to note that they were brought to replace indigenous slaves and workers who were the victims of genocide. That's what really propelled to a large part um, the African slave trade was the genocide of indigenous people. And so in 1526, it's also worth noting that the first enslaved African people to arrive in what is now the United States, this is still before 1619, um, the first enslaved African people uh, came to a Spanish colony in what is now South Carolina. It's important to note that the Spanish were colonized in parts of what is now the United States before the English even arrived. And so Often the, the story of African enslaved people to what is now the United States um, is said to start with 1619, which is an important date, of course. Um, but again, it's important to note that our Latino forefathers uh, were here in what is now the United States before the English. And so what transpired later in the colonies, of course, is very, very complex. Um, the histories of all of these nations are diverse and heterogeneous. Um, and in the same way, there was a heterogeneous system of cultural exchange, intermixing, intermarriage um, in Spanish, which is known as mestizaje. This includes uh, centuries of common struggle for basic human dignity among black and brown communities who occupied the lower caste of colonial society. Just like in the United States, Native people throughout the Americas sheltered escaped Black slaves, and Black communities supported Indigenous people in their shared struggle against a common colonial oppressor. Just like the United States, the shared racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, and ableist values were also brought by Europe European colonizers to Latin America. So they shared the same color hierarchies. You can see the stratification of people based on their skin color as part of the slide. There is a preference for certain skin color, also type of hair. So, you know, if, 
If you ever felt pressure to straighten your hair, that's internalized racism. Uh, phenotype, uh, phenotypical facial features, eye color, right? If you're ever told by your parents or grandparents to stay out of the sun to keep your skin light, these are different forms of very subtle internalized colorism and racism. And even during industrialization and the rise of the modern nation state, Latin American elites continued and still continue now to this day to share similar biases and racist beliefs as those that were uh, also being perpetuated in US society. Like August Comte's idea of positivism, which takes on the taint of racialized social Darwinism when it led to attempts at eugenics in both the United States and Latin America. In fact, in Brazil, if you isolated the Afro-Brazilian population of 100 million Afro-Brazilians, um, that would be the second largest country by population in the continent of Africa, second only to Nigeria. And in Brazil, which has 100 million Afro-Brazilians, the national flag still bears the motto of positivism, ordem e progresso, order and progress. But in this racialized construct, order, read law and order, is conceived as maintaining social control over black and brown bodies. And progress is plotted on a color hierarchy that marginalizes blackness and, and privileges whiteness at the two most extreme uh, ends of the spectrum. So it's important to note that as we celebrate the beauty and diversity of our Latinx cultures and heritages, we also commit to recognizing, acknowledging, and unlearning these colonial values of racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, and ableism that unfortunately can still be, are still very much present in the Latinx community. And I hope that we can work together collectively towards greater inclusion, social equity, and racial justice. Thank you, Ephraim, and uh, for your words, and we're going to move on to our next presenter, Dr. Cecilia Suarez. She currently serves as an assistant professor of leadership uh, and intercultural communication and global leadership. Uh, she also serves as a faculty affiliate for the Center for Latin American Studies, the Education Policy Research Center, and is the inaugural faculty president of the Latinx staff and faculty association at the University of Florida. Uh, Dr. Suarez. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, being here today. I'm very excited to be on a panel and hold space for uh, such an important conversation to have. Um, I uh, come to you as a critical race theorist, and what that means is um, race pervades every aspect of society. So when I look at um, situations, issues, challenges that, that are affecting uh, communities in particular, communities of color uh, within education and community resources, I'm centering the power that is connected to race. Um, and so thank you so much for, uh, for being able to talk about this and hold space for it. Um, what I'd like to talk a little bit about today is the intersectionality of uh, not just the, um, not just identity. So I do wanna talk a little bit about intersectionality of identity and what that means and how that impacts our communities, but also, how the Black Lives Matter movement and the fight for um, racial justice in society is intersectional to our communities. Um, sometimes people will say, well, this says Black Lives Matter, right? So we also, as uh, Latinx community members, are experiencing harm and trauma. Absolutely. This is not to say that we are not, um, but it's important to acknowledge that they, are, they go hand in hand. Um, and so uh, one of the things I want to talk about and, and, and echo what was just stated is this concept of unlearning, in particular, unlearning the concepts that were um, taught to us throughout our lives, through socialization, through our families who loved us dearly and who love us dearly, but also thinking about the challenges that we face when we are, um, when we are in a place where we have to think about uh, spaces being diverse, right, or, or, or education being diverse. And honestly, the word diversity simply means difference, right? It means that 
you have lots of different things in space. So that doesn't necessarily mean that we are talking about actually being equitable or providing justice, right, or, or focusing on justice. We are simply acknowledging that something is different. Um, and oftentimes in a space uh, as being a part of the Latinx community or um, or Hispanic, if, if that is your term, we are often unfortunately utilized as the diversity fillers, right? These quote unquote individuals who, if we are on a panel or if we are on a committee, um, we, people look around the room and say, well, we need to add some diversity. So they are adding an individual who brings enough diversity, if you will, but not necessarily um, somebody who uh, makes people feel uncomfortable, right? Or makes people feel like their words are being challenged. And so the reason why this is important to acknowledge is not to say that we do not deserve a place on a panel or that our voice does not matter. Quite the opposite. Our voice is valid. Our voice is always um, important and needs to be acknowledged. And we also can utilize this voice to look around the room and say, actually, there are some other voices missing, right? Because our voice does not necessarily um, uh, incorporate that of the Black lived experience. So I want to acknowledge that uh, we can utilize our voice and perspective to increase the way that we collaboratively uh, strengthen our communities across uh, Black and Brown borders, if you will. Um, to talk a little bit about intersectionality, um, it is a, a, a concept that has been coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, it came out of uh, critical legal studies and has been utilized a lot in critical race theory, specifically talking about the ways in which identities, uh, certain identities are compounding uh, and or when, they, when they're added together, they compound the amount of harm uh, and um, injustice that individuals face. So an example of this can definitely be, and I'm glad that we're talking about this today, is uh, individuals who identify as Afro-Latinx and thinking about how not only can an individual identify as being uh, Latinx and also uh, identify as Black or African-American, this will not only increase the chances of them experiencing uh, unequal power, but it will increase the harm that they may experience as they move through society. So this is important to understand because oftentimes we are made to pick which issue we are going to focus on, right? Are you talking about socioeconomic status or are you talking about racism? Actually, we're talking about both because they go hand in hand. They are interwoven and embedded in the very fabric of how society is functioning and how society is structured. Um, however, Oftentimes, people are, are, are made to, say, to, to pick, again, which one are you going to focus on because we only have time or we only have resources to focus on one, when in reality, they go hand in hand and you can't really pull apart uh, the issues when they are affecting an individual. Right? You can't tell somebody, well, are you more worried about your Blackness today or your Afro-Latinidadness today? Um, or are you worried about, are you going to, be have, going to have food to feed your family? Right? That is not something that you can ask someone to pull apart, right? Just as a human, you experience them, experience them all together. Um, the other thing that is important to think about um, is the way, and, and I am in higher education. So as an educator, uh, I have seen the ways uh, education has pulled apart and erased the Afro-Latinx body, right? The Afro-Latinx um, identity in ways that are uh, usually really common and go under the radar unless an individual identifies as Afro-Latinx. Um, an example would be having multiple resource centers for uh, Hispanic Latino students, Latinx students, and then having a resource center for uh, uh, Black education enrichment, and then also having a center for maybe LGBTQ plus affairs. Now, I'm not against any of these and actually in huge support of offices that always support our students who identify um, with a marginalized identity or identities. However, when I engage and, and talk with students who identify as, uh, with multiple identities, the challenge for them is which one do I pick, right? Which one, which center am I supposed to go into? Because programming doesn't necessarily combine, but there is maybe a um, a time where I can go into the Hispanic Latino Affairs Office, 
But walking in, people might give me a second look to say, oh, are you looking for the Black Education Center? Or if I go into the Black Education Center, people might say, oh, are you looking for the Latinx office? It's down the hall. So really also thinking about how the things that have been um, given to us by higher education to say, oh, you know, we know that it's hard for, for students of color. Here's some resources to, to, be, to be helpful. Um, they are continuing to erase the Afro Latinx right, body, the, uh, the identity of these students. The other thing that I, uh, when I teach my research methods courses to students is really thinking about how we ask the questions to individuals in Yay. communities. Uh, oftentimes there is a select a box, right? What, what is your, um, in a demographic, what is your race? Pick one, or you have to check, I am white Latinx or black non-Hispanic. And sometimes there are uh, more advanced, if you will, surveys or, or um, research tools that allow people to click more than one. But the simple fact that there is language that says I am black non-Hispanic, and then going back to the, um, the concept uh, that was shared previously about mestizaje, that definitely has people thinking about well, which one do I belong in, right? Do I really know where I belong? And the sense of belonging um, is really challenging for not only students, but society in general when it comes to the Latinx community as well as the Afro-Latinx community. Um, I'm looking at my notes to make sure I get everything. Um, I think I'll stop there because I'm really interested in holding space for Q&A, but uh, I want to say the last thing is if if it, if ever people are interested in thinking about where do I start to ensure that um, I am increasing the knowledge and the vi the visibility of the Afro Latinx community or just um, the the fact that Black Lives Matter right or issues with racial injustice specifically for the Black community matters to us as well the the easy and easy is in quotes because nothing is ever easy with this concept is thinking about looking at who are we reading, right? Who are we digesting? Where are we getting our information from? Are we in ourselves um, in, unable to sort of see and build our community wider? Um, I always say, look at the reading list of our educators, right? Are our readings specifically focused on um, uh, white old male theorists or are we also, also incorporating uh, black Latinx, indigenous authors, scholars, activists, community members who also are doing just as much, if not more, to create new ways of understanding, new, uh, new lines of knowledge to not only incorporate the past, but also the present struggles and triumphs of intercultural um, and uh, intersectional communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Suarez, for your insights. And we're going to move on to our next panelist, that is Dr. Leonard Savala. He's the director of the Office of Multicultural Study and Student Engagement at Wayne State University. His research focuses on the experiences of minority executives working in higher education at predominantly white institutions. And he has ample experience working both for the private sector and higher education institutions. Dr. Savala. Hello, thank you. Uh, thank you for the committee for the invite. I'm going to take a brief moment just to walk through um, higher education, the landscape. Uh, I come at this work um, from, you know, the critical race theory as well, primarily looking at Latin crit. Um, but I want to just sort of walk through uh, a little bit about my research, um, a little bit about, you know, my trajectory in higher education and sort of talk through uh, the experiences of African Americans and Latinos in higher education, specifically as we as they relate to uh, predominantly white institutions. Um, as we all know that higher education was not built for for us, uh, wasn't built to support us or uh, provide um, the services that we need. So there is a sense of conformity in terms of, of, of when you matriculate through the system in higher education. Um, you know, in my experience, particularly, you know, starting out a community college, transferring to a four year university, and then on to, uh, you know, receiving my PhD, um, you know, along that way, you know, I've always questioned, you know, where, where were the, uh, where were the, the faculty of color? 
uh, where were uh, the folks that really uh, supported me. And one instance that I can point to really quickly, I just want to share is I remember in undergrad and, uh, you know, I pursued a uh, pre-med uh, option, um, not knowing at the time as a first generation student, you know, really what that entailed. And I was in a, a biochem course and uh, I remember sitting with a, uh, a uh, advisor and they're basically looking at me and saying, hey, you might want to consider a different area. And they didn't take into account all that went into me getting to that point. Um, and so I had went over to another uh, faculty member who was African-American and she sat down and basically as I talked with her, I talked to her, she just listened. She listened to the experiences. She listened to my challenges in higher education. And, you know, she was there. She was an advocate. She was an ally. And I think, you know, I really want to come come at this from, you know, a, a, a point of working um, together uh, in unity. And um, that sort of helped propel, prepare, pro propel me through higher education. Um, my study that I did for my dissertation looked at the um, lived experiences of uh, Latinos in higher education. And um, as, I, as I looked at those experiences, uh, there wasn't really enough research out there. So what I had to dig into uh, was the experiences of uh, African-Americans in higher education, specifically again within PWIs. And what I learned um, from, from their experiences and from reading, as well as my lived experiences, is that in many of the roles in higher education, be it administrator, uh, president, or whatnot, you're often given the position, but you're not given the power. You're often given the position, um, you're not given the funding, or you are the lone person working in higher education. So not only do you have to uh, administer and do or direct, uh, you also have to advise, mentor, and support. Uh, this often becomes a challenge for a lot of tenure faculty, um, as well as others on campus who try to serve multiple roles um, as being the one and only in higher education. And that presents a unique challenge. Um, in terms of the, the experiences of, of African Americans in higher education, uh, you know, they've often, when you look at what the, the support that, that, that they've needed, um, they've often needed mentoring. They've often needed uh, the, the um, a support from uh, a community, and that hasn't always been there. And as I interviewed um, the, the Latinas and Latinos in higher education, it, it came through with the same sort of, of, of tone. Um, here we are at institutions, um, and I'm really generalizing, you know, they were saying here, here we are at institutions, and again, we are the only ones. And I, I remember quite vividly talking to one um, executive in higher education. Um, he had talked about, you know, sleeping on a dirt floor. And he had talked about what it took uh, after coming from Mexico and, and really um, putting in the work and um, trying to do his, do his best to succeed in higher education. But all along, I thought about, well, what was he giving up? What do you give up in terms of that trajectory in higher education? What do you give up in terms of, of seeking that high executive position in higher education? And many uh, talked about being the only one. And in that case, uh, specifically at PWIs, um, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't the support and um, they just needed um, other colleagues around them to help them uh, propel. Um, some of the other pieces that I wanna mention are um, uh, the experiences of women in higher education in particularly are very different uh, than men in higher education. And in, in my study, many of the women talked about um, having, um, not only did they have to deal with the racism and the sexism of the institution, they often had to deal with that from many of their colleagues as well. So the experiences of women in higher education are very much different than men and men as well. Um, there is you know, a need for additional research in that area, but I just wanted to just briefly talk through that many of the challenges and the experiences in higher education uh, have been the same for African-Americans and Latinx in higher education. Um, however, in many regards, uh, African-Americans have really um, blazed the pathway 
um, in terms of access um, for, for many of us in higher education. I'll end there. Thank you so much, Dr. Savala, for your words. And we're going to move on to our final uh, presenter for today. Uh, Ms. Jasmine Williams, she serves as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Rock Ventures, serving Quicken Loans and the family of companies. She shaped the framework for the Team Member Resource Network uh, program, a Quicken, a Quicken Loans version of employee resource groups, and currently leads the team's engagement efforts. Uh, Ms. Williams? Opens me right to. Can everyone hear me? Oh. Is that good? Okay. So I think I'm unmuted. Okay, great. <laughs> My apologies. But I think this was lined up perfectly because I, it takes us from the history to the intersection to higher education, which that piece really resonated with me. I spent seven years working in higher education and housing and residence life. And I just wanted to share a story about the importance of representation. So I had several um, halls, residence halls, and I had one that had about 400 students in it. Everyone moved in. I went to our floor meeting and I look across the room and I realized I see one brown person, one, me and that person. And I made a mental note of that. And I came into work the next day and I had a voicemail um, from that student's mother who told me, and this was, um, this was up in Grand Rapids. So they told me that, and I'm, I'm from Detroit, the student was from the Detroit area, that they got in their car, that student drove home that night and said there was no one there like them. And they, they couldn't stay there. And the only person they saw was me. And so the parent, the mom called me and was like, the reason I called you because you know I said yeah I, you know I'm a, I'm a person of color I'm a BIPOC person um, which is a, a person of color um, and she said you know, you know that's why I called you because my, my child identified that you were the only person that they saw and I was able to talk to her talk to the, the student and explain hey it was your first day that's just the building that's not the whole campus and get them to come back and, and I, I bring that up because of course one that representation is important but two the the it's just that building it's not the whole campus and I, I want to say that in terms of even in the corporate private space and nonprofit where when you go out to work, sometimes you'll get into a space that feels very intimidating, but you have to remember that is that space. It's not the whole field. And and your your place in there is really important. Um, and so I, I want to bring up something and I think that we have to undo that happens in higher education, which is when you're in school, you're learning how to move forward, right? Just how do I, how do I get in? How do I break through? How do I keep my job? How do I move up? How do I just, how do I succeed? And a lot of times that, su that, um, that success seems tied to assimilation. Um, and we're in an interesting time and this, this change has been coming for a while, but the landscape for higher education and for the, you know, employment field is changing at this moment. And what, companies are realizing is that diversity is important, not just because it looks nice on a, you know, on a, a portfolio or it looks nice on a pamphlet, but it literally can improve your business. So what we have to start to undo is the, the belief that you need to kind of squeeze down and, and shrink those, those things that you bring that are different and those challenges and those stories, because a lot of us are, are coming from some really you know, challenging situations and stories, it, you know, just on the surface level of dealing with racism and sexism and homophobia and ableism and all the isms. But sometimes it's, it's literally the things you dealt with growing up. Like I said, I'm, I'm a Detroit native, east side of Detroit. Of course, I've got some stories too of, you know, my, my upcoming, <laughs> how I got here. But those things are things we kind of tuck away. We don't want to share because we're trying to get to work. We're trying to blend in. We're trying to do our job we're trying to go home right but that's not that that is not what is needed right now i would say for the world but also it's not what's needed in the field of, a, of a, any type of employment um what companies are realizing and this has been studied so there's plenty of studies about this is that when they have a team that is both diverse and inclusive and I, I'll, I'll talk about those two things in a second they have a larger market share and that market share comes from innovation and that innovation comes from something that a lot of us hate 
um, which is the thing that feels like conflict. It's when you come, a new person comes into your space and says, well, and it makes you uncomfortable because you're used to doing it that way. You've always done it that way. You don't even maybe have an answer about why you do it that way. Um, and that's uncomfortable. That feels like conflict because someone's questioning you, questioning your process. But that's how you innovate. You don't innovate by just kind of watching and being like, I hope they figure it out. You innovate by asking questions. And so when I say diverse and inclusive, I always say diversity is butts in, seat, in seats. So when you come in, you look around, and you're like, I'm not the only one. This is great. But sometimes we get in those environments and be like, ah, actually, this environment sucks. It's terrible. Like, there's plenty of diversity, but everybody's just kind of like off to themselves, head down, do your work, don't make eye contact. And they're in the door and out the door. They're not retaining any of the diverse talent. The inclusion part is like, how do I feel in that space? Do I feel like I'm part of it? And the example I use is, and I've been in these situations where I'm new to the company, I'm sitting in a room full of higher ups, and they're making a decision. And my experience from working in higher ed and DNI, being a woman, being a Detroit native, whatever it is, tells me that decision is not a good decision that that decision will end up on the news, <laughs> that that decision will cause some extreme backlash. The difference between me saying, hey, wait a minute, I don't think we should do that, and me being like, whoo, when this hits the fan, is inclusion. If I feel included, I feel like I can take that small risk of speaking up and know that will, even if they tell me we're still moving forward, that will be met with respect and that people will hear me. And without that, I'm not anything. And so, as I said, this is, this is being shown in research and studies. And so what they're looking for are people who will come into that environment and not like, you know, dismantle it, but shake up some of the stagnant stuff that happens where even a company that's number one or number two can be better. And the companies that are number one or number two are looking to be better and willing to take that extra step to bring in diverse talent and retain it. And so what that means for folks who are listening is you're starting to think about your journey and you're applying for jobs. You want to look for those environments that are going to allow you to flourish. What are some of the things that they have in place that will make it so you feel included and so that you can grow in your career and that you can speak up and move forward? And so some things to think about, um, it was mentioned in my bio, but employee resource groups. So think of your student organizations, right? If you have a Latino student union or a Latinx student union, a group for the LGBT students, you might have a student group for um, African Americans. Those same things exist in, in, in private and in corporate and all those other spaces, and they're called employee resource groups. It's something you can join as soon as you hit the ground, and you can get resources from other folks who are similar to you about how to navigate this space. I, the example I use sometimes, because we have them, and a lot of companies have them across you know, all of their locations. If I were to move to Arizona today, I might have a team that I love, I might enjoy my job, but what if I'm the only black person? One, that's going to make me uncomfortable because I'm alone, but two, I might have questions they can't answer, like where can I get my hair done? Just you know, real simple, basic questions. So what am I supposed to do? I can go to this African-American employee resource group and ask, hey, recommendations for where I can get my hair done, or hey, can we you know, get together? When's your next meeting? So I can find a sense of community. Look at, look at what ha they have on their career website. Do they talk about diversity and inclusion? Do they have somebody who owns it? Or do they have kind of like some loosey-goosey thing, but nobody's really owning it? And what I mean is look for a chief diversity officer. Look for a team of people who are working on it. Look for multiple things that tell you that they're doing their due diligence to make the environment comfortable for everyone. And these things are important because what I don't mean are safe spaces. I mean the environment as a whole. I don't want to, and I've, I felt like this is a higher ed too. I don't want to just have this space over here and this space over here and this space over here. And these all are comfortable. But once I walk outside, it's terrible. You know, it's, it's a storm. That's not what you want. You want to be able to move freely throughout the organization and feel like everywhere you go that you are respected for your work, and you're not stereotyped for other things. So I, I know I also can talk a lot, so I'm trying to look at the time. I think the, the final thing I'll say is keep in mind that what you bring is not just the education you have, but your experiences. And that's important because the innovation, like I said earlier, comes from those experiences, right? So Quicken Loans, we sell, we sell mortgages, um, and we have a whole channel a Spanish channel dedicated to one market, which means that being bilingual, 
having experience, even like our, we have a marketing, a, a person in charge of marketing just to that market, having those experiences on top of the degree that you're getting, the education you have, gives you something that other people may not have, right? So you can go in a room and say, you know, based on my experience as, you know, a Latinx person, if we put this message out, it's not going to be received well. Or I think we need to tweak that because that doesn't actually represent how we are, right? Because I think we've all seen a commercial where we're like, whoo, that, that misses the mark. That is not <laughs> what life is like for us. It's very stereotypical, and you can tell the group of people who made it have no diversity in that room, right? But you can be that person who comes in and helps, and they will pay you for it because that market has – you know, money to spend. And so everybody wants to buy a home. And research is showing us that it's not just, you know, straight white men who are buying homes on behalf of their families. We know that women are often making the decision about when it's time to buy a home, what kind of home, what, what home in general. We know that single mothers are also buying homes. We know that certain identities have more expendable income. So there's so much research out there that supports it. So what, what it could help for you is for you to have that also in your back pocket so that when you're going into these interviews, you can share that as well. And I'm, I'm going to stop there because, like I said, I know I could talk a lot. Thank you so much, Ms. Williams, and, and thank you for being so articulate and so expressive about these issues that concern all of us. I think I'm returning the mic to Aura at this point to start the Q&A session. Can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. So I wanted to, before we open up the floor to Q&A, provide some closure and context for uh, the uh, knowledge that our panelists have provided today. Also, great, a great thank you to everyone who's joined uh, the work. This is basically an introduction, if we can call it that. This is such a um, uh, complex topic that to even call it an introduction, I think, misses the mark a little bit. So I do appreciate the panelists uh, sharing their knowledge with us today and creating that awareness. The next steps that I encourage all of us uh, to do is just as uh, Ms. Williams mentioned, be open to learning and owning our experiences and the value that that brings to innovation and, uh, and, and really contribution to our particular institutions. Also, unlearn behavior, as it was shared uh, by the panelists today, uh, and that means different things to different people. Uh, so for me personally, uh, means that picture you see there is the first picture, and I'm going to look at my female panelists because they're going to probably not and laugh when I say the picture on the screen that you see is the first ever headshot of me with my naturally curly hair <laughs> rather than a straightened hair. So when we talk about unlearned behavior, that does mean a lot to us. Um, Join Hispanic Latinx events. One of the things that the current state of the world have brought us surprisingly is the access to virtual learning across the world and across institutions. As you see today, we have several institutions of higher ed represented and of course Quicken Loans as a corporate uh, sponsor and contributor. Um, so please research and, and join their events. Um, at the end of this presentation, uh, everyone who signed in, and we will promote it also on our website. This live deck will be updated with the voice recording in addition to um, the links that are provided um, by these institutions about their Hispanic Heritage Month events as well. Um, become involved. Start if you haven't or continue if you already are doing civic engagement. That looks like census and camp, you know, canvas for the census. Uh, we, we become very uh, involved and informed about voting and, of course, learn about issues that impact our communities. That could be health disparities, educational disparities, a number of things. Some of the resources provided by our panelists today are uh, literary resources and, of course, how to get uh, engaged uh, if you are going to be involved, uh, civically speaking. And of course, a big thank you to our presenters. Um, the, um, this is our contact information. Please be safe. 
and thank you for being here. I'm going to uh, stop the recording right now so that I can access any questions that you may be having. And if we have no questions, then I will open the remaining part of the uh, presentation to our panelists. If you want to follow up or make a point that you thought we would have uh, run out of time to address.